I'm gonna, I'm gonna dress down a little bit. I'm Mayor Orlando, Giovanni de Gilead, and public uh, from down from uh, Nanon. And what I want to talk about today is the new spirit building experiment. This is not a class on the experiment. This is a class where I am going to propose a potential spear building technique for Anciora and the SCA based on period manuals. Um, so let's look at what um, what we got in history when we talked about this. Um, Degrassi says, as among all other weapons which are worn by the side, the single sword is the most honorable as being such a one which is left capable of deceit of any other. So among the weapons of the staff, the pike is the most plain, most honorable, and most noble weapon of all the rest. And uh, in this, you know, Degrassi was, was including what we're talking about today is the spear. Um, so uh, what, did, uh, what did George Silver think of uh, pole weapons? First, I will begin with the worst weapon, an imperfect and insufficient weapon and not worth speaking of, but now being highly esteemed, therefore not to be unremembered. That is the single rapier. That's what, this is what George Silver had to say about single rapier. And rapier and ponier, as opposed to rapier and, and buckler, uh, the short staff or high, half pipe Forest Bill Partisan, which is the partisan is closest to what we're doing in the SCA, that's the Italian style spear. Um, or Glade, as such like weapons of perfect length, have the advantage against the rapier. So this is this is how George Silver in 1599 felt about rapiers, uh, as opposed to uh, pole arms. Who taught spear building? And why am I focusing on spear building? Because everybody is already in love with the idea of using spear and melee, or they're completely against it. So I'm not jumping into that frame. But what I, what I really want to talk about is what we're going to do with fighter practices and tournaments and those sorts of things, which we do more commonly than just melee. Because there's no argument. Spear is fun in melee. It's a lot of fun. We've been doing it throughout the experiment. Uh, but who taught the spear building and where did it come from? Well, the earliest um, really good manual that we can derive come from Fiore in 1409. And he did, uh, he did a treaty on defense uh, called the Rose of Battle, or the Flower of Battle. Um, and he, in there, goes extensively over spear and stack. And he actually uses similar um, guards and techniques with his longsword and his spear and stack. Uh, the next person that we see is, uh, is Filippo uh, Abadi. Uh, he wrote his uh, Gladiatoria in uh, 1485. Now, Vadi derives a lot of his work from Fiore, but he also expands on Fiore a lot as well. So the body of real work that we have for spear dueling is tied up in these two gentlemen. Because really after this, as you go later and later, spear dueling becomes less and less common as judicial duels become less and less common. And they start becoming duels for honor. So, Starting with Marazzo, most of what Marazzo talks about when it comes to pole arms is really derived from the original works of Body and Fiori. Same thing with uh, Mare and Degrassi and Silver. These gentlemen all derive a lot of their concepts um, and don't expand too much on them, but they, they put them in the context of their generation. But really, they're using the same techniques that go all the way back to Fiori. Interesting thing about Fiore, um, he was a knight. Um, he was also highly um, protective of his art. He considered it like, he considered it a secret art that he did. And you had to, you and your family had to vow secrecy if he were to teach you his art of, uh, of spear and, uh, and uh, defense. So this is, this is who was really teaching it. Who was teaching it. One last thing, the proposition that we got here. Um, and, um, and Don Well and I were talking about this in the hallway. But the proposition for spear in the SCA, we fight rapier, right? How many, how many people here have grappled a guy to the ground in a rapier fight in the SCA? Legally. No. <laughs> How many, I mean, how many people here have, have bound their, uh, their opponent's legs up in a legal rapier fight? Nobody. How many people have, have used a legal percussive blow to the neck? And not cut and thrust. <laughs> we don't do those things. Um, 
But how many, how many of the period masters taught those things? Almost all of them. And you really don't see until uh, about Agrippa's time uh, a divergence from that. So almost all of them taught those things. But what we've done in the SCA is we've distilled this, this thrusty thing that we can do because we want to do it. We want to have fun and, and be a little violent and be a little honorable. But we also don't want to have the concerns that come with percussives and grappling as well because it makes it more accessible to everybody. So we, we've distilled a form of rape here in the SCA that we can enjoy ourselves that doesn't include those components. That's my proposition today is can we distill a form of spear in the SCA that withdraws those components that would be too dangerous for the level of play and honor that we're willing to accept in the rapier community. And I think we can. That's what we're going to talk about next. So let's go into the sphere. Who's uh, who here fights any kind of bull arm on the heavy side? I have. Okay, so we've got a couple of people. Um, so you're probably familiar with most of the term, but uh, you know, a big one that I always run into is um, what do you call the big wooden thing that your hands go on? Um, and it's called a haft. So this is this is called the haft, the, the part of the, the handle. It's called the haft on a on a pole arm. Um, the blade, there's many names depending on what your persona prefers. Uh, the iron, in, in Italian, when they said the pike, they actually meant the blade of the pole arm when they said the pike. Um, and then the same is in, uh, in rapier, the very tip can be considered the, the debile, the foil, the feeble, a lot of different terms out there for the very tip. It's the weak end of your, of your blade. Now, in period, um, they, uh, they included the use of a part of the blade, the part of the pole arm that we're not going to use in the SCA initially, and that's going to be the heel. And the heel was definitely, because they considered this a uh, quarterstaff with a big sharp thing on the end of it. <laughs> okay, and you'll see that later on if you're it. So, so what we're really talking about here, though, is we're talking about a weapon that is designed to reach out and touch your opponent and keep you as far away from him as possible. Now, in period, you'll notice these are very flexible. It's James Adjust A dagger, 18 inch. Um, in period, these would have been very rigid. And they probably wouldn't have been 18 inch. Well, some partisans might have had, may have had close to an 18 inch. Uh, but for, for a standard partisan, you're probably looking at more like a 12 inch blade. But they would have been very rigid and very good for parrying. What you're going to find out this afternoon in the practical portion is that these are not necessarily very good for pairing or pairing against with the half to the foot. Um, so we're still in a search for the Goldilocks blade, so to speak. Uh, we found blades that are too rigid, and you know, not even Iron Man would want to face this blade. And then we found these blades like this that are very flexible and sometimes hard to call. Okay? But if you like playing with spear, this is a good way to go. Okay, so spear foundation. Uh, recommended method for training rapier spear. Um, I would like my lovely assistant to come up here. Um, everybody, this is uh, Lady Anna. Anastasia. Anastasia. She's going to be our lovely assistant today. Um, so, what we're going to start with is. Stands and grip. How do you stand with a spear? So let's start with the common stance in the low bar. Okay, so you want your, your feet a little more than the shoulder width apart, very similar to rapier stance, but you want, to, you want to be on the toes of your feet. Okay, you're up on the balls, say. And you want the half to just be almost centered, but a little more weight to the front. And that gives you a little leverage, a little better leverage in the back. As you can see here, I bring this, this is from, uh, from one of the period manuals that I researched. However, you will notice that I said that the balance should be almost equal, but not perfectly so. The leading hand should in fact allow the weapon to balance ever so slightly towards the point. It gives you a little better leverage as you're moving it around. Go and show, show the leverage with your back hand. Just like that. So, it's clearly with the with the period weapon, with the iron head is to add on the weight to the end. And so choking up a little bit on the aft makes sense. But with this one, 
Why would you not put the back hand all the way the back of the hand? It, it depends on the situation. Um, in melee, you might, for an extra reach, yeah. want to get to the back hand. But in a duel, you may want to keep it available for parries, for interesting parries. So we'll go over that here, here in a few, with where the different hand positions uh, work in. So two ways that you can hold the grip. You can hold your grip, thumbs forward. You can hold your grip, thumbs inward. Thumbs forward, thumb forward is going to give you better control over the blade and better point control. Thumb over is going to give you better, stronger parries, but not as good a point control with the tip. So those are the two grips. So moving right along, footwork. Your footwork in um, spear is pretty similar to what you would do in longsword and include and rapier including. Uh, and you've got your advances, your retreats, you've got your passes, uh, you've got your retreats, passes backwards, and your turns. All the same. We're going to go over a couple of them here. So first, I'm going to demo on this side so everybody on this side can see as well. First thing we're going to look at, your standard advance is really just going to be exactly what you would do in rapier. Just moving forward, bringing your front foot forward, or your back foot backwards for a retreat. Just like that. Passes are pretty similar, but when you pass forward, you generally want to do a cambiamento, which is a change of leads. And the same thing when you pass backwards, it's just like that. Your volta, your voltes are all the same. Mezza volta, forward and back, or stabile, volta stabile, I should say. Mezza volta, which is right here, and then a full volta, which is right here, which is basically a pass without the change of leads. Does that make sense? Okay. Next. Okay, so now we're going to go over the guards a little bit. Um, and the guards, this is where things start to get really different. So the foundational guards, there's four foundational guards, and then we're going to go over six specialized guards. And the six specialized guards go all the way back to Fiore. The four foundational guards are also what a lot of people call the common method. The common method is the method that you would use in both uh, dueling and melee. So first of all, we're going to focus more on your rear hand than on your front hand. So we're going to start with the low guard. The low guard is simply your rear hand down. Your, your blade can be at your opponent's head, or it can be down at your opponent's stomach, just like that. But the low guard is down by your hip, just like that. The next guard we're going to go into is the high guard, which is hand straight up. From the high guard, you can move your tip anywhere you want, like this. But the basic tenet of the high guard is that it is above your head. We're striking downward, just like that. Next. Okay, the next two guards of the common method are the straight guard, which is right here, and then the bastard high guard, right there. The difference in the bastard high guard and the high guard is that with the bastard high guard, you have your hand at about cheek level instead of above your head. Now, the bastard high guard is never uh, discussed um, or named by any of the masters, but you can see it in a lot of their iconography. So that's why we decided to include it here. So there's our four guards that we're recommending as the core foundation of spear. Next slide. So some other foundational uh, techniques for guard. Cambiamento. Cambiamento means changing leads. Anybody that's done spear on the ship side understands changing leads. Recommended way to do cambiamento is you're going to pass and slide your slide the half forward in your front hand, or slide your rear hand forward like this, and then switch right there, and then come back. That's changing leads. The same thing when you step backwards, to pass backwards, you bring the rear hand forward, change over, and bring the lead hand back. Now, in the fret, a cambiamento may be a little more, a little smoother than that. But this is a good way for somebody to learn. 
how to do it as well. Because sometimes it may end up being a much faster move than that. So, but basically the way, the way that I'm, I'm recommending that it's, that it's taught is going to be that we come up like this and back. And same thing, change back here. Yes? Because it leaves you exposed while you're doing it, it, it seems odd at first glance. But if you do that while you're behind someone else, you know, so you're, you're, you're in that group fight situation, someone else is fighting in front of you, and you're stepping from one side of to the other side, switching hands as you go, and then it works very well and you're protecting what you And that's a good point. Let me, I'll, I'll show you an example of exactly what, what you're talking about. So if I'm, if I'm here, right, and a common method, as being part of the common method, you won't see much of this in, in dueling. Uh, unless it's a, uh, it's, unless it's a, a punta cambio, which is a, which is a thrust with a, with a change of leaves. So it would be something like this. So if I'm here, right, I, I've got really good shots over here, over here. So say I want to get, get somebody over there, back over there. What I might do is I might back off the line a bit and then change leads over here and then come over to this side. And then I can shoot across here. Or the same thing, if I'm already here, shooting this way and I'm going to shoot over there and I've got a, a shield man or something like that here then what I might do is come back change leads so that I come out on this side being able to shoot on this side because you'll notice that whatever side my half is on is the opposite of the side that I have the best strikes on in melee so if my half is on the right side my, my best thrusts are all going to be to the left so that's a very good example right there of when you might do a change of leads right here when you have uh, a shield bend or something like that. Uh, Cambiamento can be the bread and butter of a spearman. This is something that, this is one of those things you should go in your backyard and practice over and over and over again. It should feel so very natural because it doesn't feel natural the first time you do it. Okay, next slide. Okay, now the basic thrust. Um, we're going to go over four basic thrusts, and we'll go more in, at length than these this afternoon. The, um, the first one is the punta portada. So, on guard and the low guard, punta portada is basically the carried thrust. You'll notice the spear does not move in my hands. My grip stays stable the whole time. Punta portada, just like that. Our next thrust is going to be the punta slanciata. Punta slanciata is the flung thrust. This is the most common thrust that you'll see on the field. The flung thrust is you're just moving it like a cue, like a cue, or a pull, like a pull stick. Just like that. Just letting it slide in your hands. The next thrust that we're looking at is going to be the uh, the, the punta cambio, which we just discussed. Punta cambio is basically a thrust with a change of leads. This works differently. Now remember with the cambiamento, which hand goes forward first? Your rear hand comes forward and then they switch. With the punta cambia, your, your lead hand actually remains, actually moves on, on the hand. So with the punta cambia, you're going to do a pass forward, and then back, just like that. One more, one more time. Punta cambia, pass forward, and then change back. Another one that has to be practiced because it feels awkward, okay? Very awkward when you first start this. One more time. Same thing, forward, and then up, just like that. And then finally, there's the shortened thrust. A shortened thrust is for those times that we come in, pass each other like that, and then we want to bring it in and shoot. That's a shortened thrust right there. One more, let's show them again. So we come in, pass, and you pull with your rear hand down like that and thrust into them. Shorten the thrust. It's important that you pull with your rear hand. Let the half slide your front hand for that. One of the things that can really slow you down is that guy shoots and then he's like, doing that. Okay? You're dead by the time you're like, because you'll see him freaking out of it. Like, oh my god, get down here. Ah. You know? And when your half is only five feet, you can reach the hole, do it different. But your half is nine feet, 
to do the short one for us. You may have to do two or three. You may have to it's every bit as awkward as you just showed. It is. It's very awkward. Like, oh my God, it's going to get me, you know? Yeah, so, so another one that you really have to practice to be good at, okay? The, um, the, the cambiamento, uh, punta cambia, and that short and thrust are all three difficult techniques to get used to. Most of the other thrusts, punta portada, is pretty basic. Carry thrust. As a matter of fact, I would say people people don't use punta portada as often as they should. People really rely on that flowing thrust way too much. The problem with the flow thrust, and this comes into our next set, if you can hit the next slide. This again you should be after here. Um, what's wrong with that? <laughs> 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 So, um, so, so with a flung thrust, flung thrust you're, gonna, you're really open yourself up to parries. And these are the basic parries of the common method that we're going to go over here. Um, so, one eye, I'm going to face the audience real quick. We're discussing inside and outside. The side of Ana closest to me is her inside right now. The, the side of Ana furthest from me is her outside. And it's pretty much the same as when we're here. Um, below her waist is low, and above her waist is high. Unlike right here, where they generally look at where you're holding your blade. Okay, you want to face back in me? Um, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to throw a shot at her inside arm. Okay, and I'm going to come in with a shot. <laughs> Slowly this time, so they can see exactly how you how you do it. You'll notice that she's mostly only moving her rear hand, just like that. Now throw one at me. See how my rear hand drops down to my hip. This is how you get that good sting without taking your front hand offline too much. Just like that. Bam! Knock it into there. Come back. Come in on the inside line. Just like that. Again. Just like that, half to half. Remember that. Half to half is how you want to try and parry. If you get half to foible or foible or foible, you've got a fail parry, get out of dodge. Okay? For those of us that, that, that think about the differences between a fail and a successful parry, that can, that can mean life or death. So anything that's not half to half, it's a fail parry, don't repose. Okay, so that's for inside line. So now I'm going to go to on his outside line. This is a little harder. We get one of the longer halves to match here. Like, here we go. This is a little harder with these. But you got to remember, you definitely want half to half. If you miss it, what is it? It's a failed pair. Okay. So outside line, just like that. Boom. So what she's doing is she's doing, she is doing a uh, mezza volta of the hand. For those of you that don't know Italian, that is a half turn of the hand to the outside. If it's on the high line, she's going to do a mezza volta, knuckles up, just like that. Boom. If it's on the low line, she's going to do a mezza volta, knuckles down. Just like that. Once again, awkward parrots. But if you can get used to these, just like just like in right here, I don't know who's ever who's done the doorknob drill where you just circle around a doorknob with, with the tip, right? And uh, it's the same thing. There's there's a mechanical education that needs to go on with your muscles. Get used to these types of parrots, but they will be your shortest, most successful parrots if you get used to them. So I'm going. So we're going to go to her low, her low line this time on the out, on the on her outside. Man, just like that. High line. Perfect. Okay. So finally, we're going to look at the uh, we're going to look at the low attack uh, to the inside. Low attack to the inside 
is basically um, gonna, it's the same as, as the high line, except you're sweeping into your high guard. So instead of dropping with the low guard, you're gonna drop and sweep to the high guard, just like that. So I come in. That makes sense to everybody? Just like that. Okay, next slide. Or previous. Uh, we're back. Sorry, we're back. Now I'm going to go over disengages and change lines. Now that we've got the parries out of the way. So, um, in the common method, two basic uh, types of disengages. Uh, Capazione, which is the disengage we all learn right here. It's, it's just, it's the doorknob drill. Um, and then the slide, which is a disengage that you can, that you use some, somewhat emulate in sword, but it's, it's really uh, specifically uh, good with uh, spear. So, I'm gonna, let's start with the Capazione. I'm gonna throw, at your, um, at your outside line, you're going to parry it, and then I'm going to disengage. Just like that. Same thing. So what happened in this period is it was 
really so brutal and these happen so often as a matter of, of forcing people to do what you wanted them to do that a lot of people learn how to use a lot of different weapons. So um, I might be really good at longsword. And so if someone were to want to duel with me, you know, if I was defending in a duel, I might pick longsword. Um, you know, whereas Don Llewellyn might be really good at uh, short spear. And his, if he's a defendant, he's going to pick short spear for that. And so that's why when you read like Morazzo and a lot of these manuals, they have everything. Morazzo even has short spear and rotella. I mean, it looks, it looks like a Greek soldier in there, you know? And it's, it's uh, because literally you never knew what you were going to get stuck with in these, these traditional tools. So these are the specialized techniques in the event that you got stuck with spear. So next slide. Okay, all of these I'm, I'm pulling straight from Fiore because honestly everybody else after him pulled straight from Fiore. I mean, he, he was, he, you know, or it just stopped being an art for him. So we're pulling all of these straight from Fiore. And what I've, what I've done is I've taken six guards that, uh, that he discussed. And most of these guards are also longsword guards for those of you that do longsword as well. And um, we're going to distill them down into a good spear technique. Um, and they all, the first three, are pretty much the same as the second three, except the first three are going to be on the right side, and the second three are going to be on the left side. So let's go with our first guard. Next slide. Okay, so first guard. Full iron gate. Tut the Porta de Ferro. Some people say it means iron gate. I like iron gate, it sounds cool. So basically, um, balls on your feet, leaning back heavily on your right foot, right hand near the upper part of the half, left hand down near the lower part. In some, in some examples, you see them holding it like this, almost like a baseball bat. Okay? So it's really depending on where you're going to go from this. So it, it could be in different places. We're going, to, we're going to have it more centered like this to, stick, to build it into the common method. So that's our first guard right there. Next slide. Okay, so the second guard, Porta de Ferro Meza, which is the half iron guard, just like that. And an easy way to go from Iron gate down to half iron gate is to just do a quick volta stabile forward into it. Just like that. And you're basically changing the weight from your right to your left. So that would be a transition. It's a train. Well, they're, they're all guards. Um, but that's not where you Half iron you gate. Stay, stay in that position. You might. It depends on, on where you're at. But hopefully, if it's a good balance, you're not in many positions for very long. So, but it, but most of the guards are, are a transition, in my opinion, into attacking someone. So I, I haven't actually categorized what's transitional as opposed to transition. Okay, so the next guard, next slide, is going to be the right window. Um, right window. Once again, we're going to shift our weight and do a, a mezzo volta to the rear and shift our weight to our back leg and we come around. And you might look at me like, Orlando, that looks awkward. <laughs> it is awkward. <laughs> I'm just telling you what they do. But everything's awkward when you first start. Remember that. Yes? Is it better to keep your hands wide apart on that or can you put them close together? You can put them wherever you're most comfortable. And, and I'll show you what, what really drives this here in a second as we go into the neck guard. So, um, so back to half iron gate. Both the stabile, up, cross your arms. Next slide. Next slide. Now we're going to go into boar's tooth. So this is now where we transition to the left side. We go from here. So as we transition to the left side, a good way to transition is to bring a shot that we will never do in this game, but it's going to be a blow to their left side, like that, 
and then we come back, shifting your weight back to your rear leg. So once again, Either. 
So it, it, it's always one of those guards that maybe maybe it gets taken out of there. And that left iron gate is very powerful for anybody right-handed to cut against you. But if you're not using this against the cut, your your defense there is of, of he was he's using that. this against thrusts. And so right. oh yes, I didn't say no. It, 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 yeah. it, it, it is an even stronger value with the defense against the cut. Yes, it is like. On a good face, me. The uh, so so one thing we get with with iron gates. A lot of a lot of most traditional tools they would have started in either iron gate or uh, or left window or something like that. And so uh, going to head forward to my uh, inside line. So if she comes in like that, you know, from here, I can come out right there and bring in a shorter thrust in, or I can come out and block. And then as I as I change back, I can give a shot there. Yes. Like that. And so with this it gets gets her point off my I can get out now and give a parting shot as I go back. Essential for the country. Yeah. Now what what they would have done five minutes ago. If you yeah, if come in at again, <laughs> what they really would have done was they would have done something more like we're all this line right here, and then, and then come up, possibly, or is there a table by the way, and bring it around with the heel strike. Um, same thing from, from here. We'll go over this more in the, in the practical. So if she comes on the outside like that, you know, what I might do is shoot here, you know, and then from here, I can pass forward with a thrust or I can just defend, but I can also do, um, if she comes in, I can also do this, you know, and come up with a heel strike. Right. And when I can threaten the heel strike, then it becomes much more powerful. Right? Yeah. Because I can threaten the heel strike, because our rules say I can, it, it loses something of its benefit. It does. It really does. And that's what we're going to have to play with it and see what works and what doesn't work. What, what I fear is that it just becomes um, so one, one thing I noticed with what we do um, in the last five minutes we've got, really, really big thing that I noticed with the spear is in the way that we play, there's not much opportunity for reposting or counterattacks. Um, because many of their counterattacks took different forms than what we're willing to do. Um, but I think we can try to develop that. Uh, at the end of the day, it may not work out. We may decide it's no good because it just becomes this you know, sort of poking at each other. For instance, as long as you yeah. keep your point up. Yeah, as long as you keep the point up. Which gets you right back to nothing but the. Yeah, yeah, nothing but But this thing, you know, you, you say in a common method, so. But we'll go over, we'll go over more of that. We'll look at the plays, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna take notes. Yes. Our draw cuts can be authorized with spears. So. Mm. Yeah, so. Oh, draw cuts. No, not now, not right now. Okay, okay. Maybe. I mean, okay, so here's the thing. Before they started the experiment, they would have been because the spear is just a dagger with a long, with a long handle. <laughs> when they opened the spear experiment, they codified it and said no draw cuts. So, depending on where it goes, I don't know, Peter's, Peter's talking a lot about it and they're going to have more to follow. But, um, if, right now it's not allowed. If Lockwood was a permanent decision maker, it'd all be in. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's not. Out. And so, if we, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. I don't, you know. I can see tip cuts and short draw cuts for you. Mm -hmm. That makes your point. Because as long as you get that behind somebody's knee and just do a little, they're down. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And I can do that with yeah. my sword. Especially yeah. the part of them, part of them, very sharp. Yeah. And, and the, the idea that the toe is, is a, uh, Available target, which of course with the glaive, which I keep saying is similar, I can't do. Suddenly you got something else new to play with because you got reach. It's if you can hit that toe without exposing your hand. <laughs> yep. So, and what we got in the practical portion, we got um, six six plays that focus primarily on the common method, and then I've, I've got two plays that focus on Fiori's uh, teachings and. Um, and then 
we're going to take some notes and and maybe develop further from that. You know, maybe some other people can come up with some ideas and give a class that build at some point that builds on this even, or you know, suggest other things. Because this is all suggested, not just at this point. Um, do they have a sign in for this or not? If not, can I, can I get um, let me get a quick count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, I'm gonna count this. <laughs> so yeah, we have 12 total. Um, any other questions or comments? Who's going to be here for the practical portion this afternoon? When is it? At 2.15. Is it 2.15? Uh, maybe not. Depends on what Okay, bring your, bring your rapier here. Okay? And you can also bring people that didn't, that didn't make it to this. this they're not, there's not a prerequisite system. We're not going to force anybody out. And, and really, for the people that just want to go over the specifics, we'll go over the progression again. This afternoon in detail, get everybody used to that, and then we'll go over the plays, and then maybe have some free time to just sort of, just sort of mess around. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on the plays. I'm just going to hit them play one through six, and then the two specialized plays, and then, and then we're going to have free time and sort of have fun with this year. So, thank you. Thank you, everybody.